Hi, Emma, can you hear me? Yeah, can Steve? Yeah, we'll we'll go live um in a few minutes. All right. Yeah, we'll do. Yeah, I'll just mute again. Good morning everyone and um, thank you for joining us. I'm joined today by MGF Engineering Director and Temporary Works Forum Director Steve Hesketh. Our webinar today is slightly different to our previous three in that we're running it as a Q&A session. So please get involved and submit your questions at, at any point. We have some leading topics to keep the, the interview flowing but if at any point in the discussion there's something you want to know more about or if you have a different question for Steve on the topic, then please submit those using the Q&A box or the chat box within Zoom. As the country looks set to move out of lockdown via the government's roadmap, we are continuing to keep the conversation between businesses going. We want to really encourage the conversations to challenge is issues within the construction industry and to make it safer for everyone. As many of you will know, it was our 40th birthday last month and 
whilst it was a real shame that we can't all get together and celebrate, it was really great to see so many comments from both MGF employees and customers reminiscing over their time working together. So if there's anything that, that you'd like to submit, any memories, um, please email them to me at marketing at mgf.co.uk and we can share those as well. MGF are recognised as one of the leaders in the design, manufacture and provision of modular and bespoke excavation and structural support systems. We're committed to providing our customers with the complete engineered solution and promoting current best practice for all type of, of excavation and structural works with supporting safety, piling and lifting departments. Our digital capabilities have evolved hugely and we're now issue, issuing all designs of any size with a 3D Autodesk Revit model drawing. We're committed to continuing to meet up with customers and collaborate on projects, but virtually now, deliver training through Microsoft Teams and Zoom, as well as spending the time redeveloping our website to provide as much information as possible to customers that aren't able to meet face to face with our teams. So as I said at the start, this is a Q&A session. So fire away with the questions. There's a chat box and a Q&A box on the bottom of the screen within Zoom. Alternatively, you can send your questions through to marketing at mgf.co.uk um, and I'll pick those up either way. We will also be running some polls on Zoom, but these are only available when you're watching live. So let's get started. Steve, you're obviously passionate about the adoption of digital technologies within construction, but why do you think it's so important for temporary works designers? Yeah, th thanks, Emma. Uh, good morning, everybody. Yes, I think it's extremely important. Um, if you get a group of uh, temporary works designers together, uh, as we do at the temporary works forum meetings, we have about 150, um, sorry, pre-COVID, <laughs> um, designers together uh, discussing the issues of the day. And a recurring theme is always the fact that the temporary works has not been adequately covered by either the permanent works designers or considered in the concept stage of a, a project. And what we uh, members of this forum are cons constantly finding is that um, there's too little time um, allowed for the temporary works design. There's not enough information and there are some major issues with the um, temporary works design not having been considered adequately in the process, which puts us up against um, sort of a great sort of time pressure and a delivery pressure to get uh, the solutions provided. So what does digital and BIM, if you like, offer us? Well, it offers us a solution to this issue because basically uh, BIM is all about collaboration, following process and sharing information. So what it allows us to do is get involved early days. Now, the ideal thing is that the temporary works are considered a concept stage. And if you imagine most projects at the concept stage, you'll have the clients involved, the permanent works designers and planners and estimators. So at this stage, um, we would like uh, through the BIM processes and we're working with a number of groups to, to uh, uh, actually develop this is that the temporary works is adequately considered. Now, on a lot of projects, it won't be a major issue. It'll be fairly standard temporary works, but on some, it could be critical to the success of the project. And time and again, our members are identifying projects where if the permanent works design could have been adapted or uh, slightly changed, uh, the resulting uh, problems for the temporary works would have been minimized. And when you look at health and safety, this could have a major impact on health and safety decisions. So. Basically, through the process of digital collaboration, we can build in health and safety checks and uh, checks on the practicality of the temporary works that are going with the permanent works design as envisaged by the client and the permanent works designer. So elaborating a bit more on that. So if you imagine what we're trying to do here is uh, as a temporary works designer place, normally it would be a piece of temporary works equipment. So it would normally come from a proprietary supplier of these products, uh, the vast majority is done using modular systems. Uh, so basically you're trying to place that equipment in a 3D format onto what you're trying to build, the permanent works and the site, construction site that, that uh, you have in place. So by doing this early doors, um, what we're doing is we're actually starting to develop a concept called the construction rehearsal. And what it means is by producing the designs in 3D and uh, 
giving this uh, to the project team early doors during the concept stage, you can actually place the equipment in a location at a time within a sequence of the construction program. What that means is as you're doing this, you're educating the client, the permanent works designers, uh, the planners and the estimators as to the scale and the context of the temporary works. And what that's allowing you to do is um, take out any major health and safety issues early doors and any major constraints to productivity. Now, the added benefit of that is obviously that this is in line with uh, the UK government's uh, Construction 2025 industrial strategy. And the concept is obviously to improve productivity, to improve health and safety and environmental benefit. So if you imagine temporary works is basically temporary works equipment um, provided to the construction site. So, so most of it is provided by the supply chain uh, uh, firms like MGF. And basically we can input that information early doors through the design process into the concept and build that in, <clears throat> which will help achieve the government strategy of um, increasing productivity. So there will be no problems during the construction phase in terms of either high health and safety risk or in terms of actually the productivity being delayed by a temporary works issue. And by combining all these, we believe um, we can help with the government 2025 20, strategy. And temporary works is sort of uniquely situated because the vast majority is off-site manufactured, it's modular systems, it's used thousands of times. You know, many of our products can last 10 to 20 years and be used hundreds of times across the country. So the benefit of that is, if you look in terms of the environmental impact, is the only embodied energy in these um, uh, supplying these systems is actually in the transport costs. So it's um, by having a network of depots, you can supply um, equipment quickly to a site and minimise the carbon footprint uh, in terms of the transport costs. So for all these reasons, um, temporary works uh, designers are very well placed to use this digital technology and make sure it's embedded within the, the BIM processes. Great. Um, so just a bit of a, a question to the audience, really. So, you know, do you think that permanent works designers adequately consider the temporary works requirements in their concept design? Steve, I don't know whether you've got any thoughts on this. Yeah, well, well, well the other thing is, uh, I, I'm actually, uh, for, for the first half of my career, I um, came to MGF in 2005, been here 16 years. I was actually a permanent works designer working for uh, major contractors on design and build projects working for the likes of AMEC, Bechtel and Caverna. So I actually can see it from both sides. And, you know, uh, and what I can say without any doubt is that the vast majority of permanent works designers don't adequately understand temporary works design. So uh, you know, um, if it's either a complex temporary works design or it's a large scale one, they're always better talking to either a temporary works design specialist or to a temporary works uh, supplier like ourselves. So the result, the results of that, um, it should be on screen now. So you know. Okay, that's very interesting. Yeah. So obviously, there's a lot of temporary works designers in on this meeting, because <laughs> and, and that's the, the the constant complaint that we get at the temporary works forum and that we're trying to work to address. So you know, we are in discussions. We're trying to encourage uh, clients and permanent works designers, planners, estimators to get involved in the temporary works forum and understand what what we are trying to say. So uh, that's very interesting. And totally not unexpected, Emma. <laughs> so there's a question come in, Steve, about the awareness. Of, you know, so given given your concerns over the awareness for permanent works designers, should temporary works design be a specific module on undergraduate apprenticeships? You know, academic training programs. Uh, definitely, and I know myself and other temporary works forum members. We do do guest lectures on undergraduate courses. So we have tie-ups locally in the northwest here with uh, the University of Salford, uh, University of Manchester, and University of Liverpool. And we do regularly do uh, lectures on temporary works, and it's trying to build that into uh, you know the, the curriculums. And a number of our uh, staff uh, are on industrial advisory boards with the civil engineering departments. And yes, it, it, it's, it's a major thing that we have to work with. And I'm glad to say that a lot of the Temporary Works Forum members are doing the same thing. Brill, thank you. So, um, you know, how are you trying to encourage the, the adoption across the industry? 
Yeah, uh, well, well, I actually head up the um, digital group within the Temporary Works Forum, Working Group 15, and looking at digital collaboration. And we work across a number of industry bodies. Uh, we work closely with uh, people like the HSC, Boom for Health and Safety Group, uh, the Institution of Civil Engineers, Institution of Structural Engineers. Uh, and basically, we're trying to encourage um, you know, its adoption within Temporary Works Design and within uh, the construction processes. So. Uh, we, we are heavily involved with a number of groups and we're trying to make sure that um, uh, we're input into um, the processes and procedures that are being built into the BIM um, development uh, uh, processes at the moment and the standards. So we do it via the Temporary Works Forum, by lectures, education and going to other organisations meetings, uh, but also um, MGF are members of the Shoring Technology Interest Group, which is part of the Construction Plant Hire Association. And basically, as I mentioned earlier, most of the temporary works equipment that you see on site will come from a supplier. And the STIG, um, the Shoring Technology Interest Group, basically that uh, nearly all the manufacturers and suppliers of temporary works shoring equipment um, on, uh, below ground systems actually attend that meeting. And through that forum, we try and promote uh, best practice and health and safety uh, within the industry. And a key part of that is encouraging all the members to adopt the 3D technology. So if you imagine that is purely making sure that our 3D CAD blocks, if you like, are available uh, to our customers. And that we're generating the right kind of information to be used within a BIM environment on, on major projects and the like. So we're working hard at trying to encourage the supply chain and uh, other parts of the construction industry to recognize the importance of temporary works in the construction process and build that into uh, the processes as well. Now, the, the other thing is um, we, we're also working closely with the British Standards Institute. And I actually sit on one of the uh, European CEN committees, which is trying to unify all the um, product design codes at the moment. And again, within that process, we're trying to build in the procedures that are written into British Standard 5975, which is basically um, a set of procedures unique to the UK for managing temporary works in a safe manner. And we're trying to make sure all that is built into the, um, the um, BIM standards going forward and is fully considered. So that combined with talking to the HSE and building in the requirements of the construction design and management regulations 2015, looking at the issues of um, how the principal designer um, uh, communicates between the different parties, particularly the temporary works designers and providing the information at the right time to everybody. So as you can see, there's, there's quite a few areas that we're working on and basically it's all about promoting um, the consideration of temporary works early doors and it's about uh, making sure that the um, specialists, uh, the suppliers, the temporary works designers that uh, occupy this area um, are actually involved in those discussions. And we're encouraging all our members to adopt um, you know, the basics of um, BIM or uh, digital collaboration. And just to put a lot of people's minds at rest because they, they worry about this, you know, when I'm talking BIM, there's, uh, there's two elements of BIM. I, I call it the big BIM, which will be a cross rail type project or HS2, which has got loads of BIM modelers, um, very um, BIM intensive, lots of protocols, lots of procedures. That actually is not the majority of temporary works. The vast majority is on much smaller projects. So all we're saying really with this is that temporary works designers should be able to produce their designs in 3D be able to share that information and they should be able to just provide data associated with those designs like the residual risk registers, um, component lists, um, maintenance requirements. All they need to do is provide that in a sort of spreadsheet type format. It's as simple as that. So it's just trying to encourage people to embrace 3D and um, to start sharing the information in, um, it, you know, in an organized and structured manner, which should increase productivity for everybody, uh, stop anything going wrong on site and massively improve health and safety awareness. So, so just on the, on the back of what you say, and then Steve, we can put the next poll out, which, you know, is asking the audience, are you likely to use 3D modeling during your product, during your project? Um, Steve, yeah. again, I don't know whether you've got any thoughts. Yeah. And again, it, it doesn't have to be the full BIM. You know, uh, if you look at uh, you know, the, the, the 3D software at the moment, the CAD uh, packages uh, are not, they're hardly any more expensive than 2D. 
Um, it's very easy to use. It's just making sure people you know, uh, are open to it. And the, the, the concept of actually using that to communicate risks, to communicate design solutions, and communicate importantly with the site teams. So we're working at, you know, the, the easiest way to communicate with the site team to show them a 3D image of what you're proposing and what you want them to build. And it's all about, you know, communicating with the trades um, and, you know, 3D is definitely the way forward. Yeah, so the, the, these are the, that's the result of this this latest poll. Again. Okay, well, that's very encouraging, yeah. So, uh, yeah, and uh, that's uh, that's good That's good to see. And, uh, yeah, I, I think it, for me, it's just a case of it's not uh, if you're going to adopt 3D, it's just when, you know, and basically for me, the sooner the better. Brill, so how does MGF use digital technologies for the benefit of the business and its customers? Yeah, well, it's, it's actually an interesting story, and it's sort of, um, <laughs> um, I go back to 2005 when I came to um, MGF from, from AMEC, and basically I, I was used to 3D on major projects. Um, I was used to petrochem nuclear industries, so 3D was normal to me. And when I joined MGF, you know, obviously everything was done in 2D and we didn't have any information um, to go on. So we had to start from scratch. But what became very apparent early doors is because we were a manufacturer, you know, it absolutely massively benefited us to model everything in 3D for the manufacturing process. What it also allowed us to do was once we had the 3D images of all our equipment. So bear in mind, we've got you know, thousands of different components and different configurations, um, you know, the, it used to be a bit of a, like a running joke that within the company it would take probably two to three years of working for MGF to actually understand all the kit that we had and how it went together. And that was because it wasn't in 3D. So very quickly we invested in 3D software and started actually producing the manufacturing drawings um, from 3D, which then let us build up the technical files in 3D. And that was the start of things. And I can go back to about uh, 2009. And we first then got involved with BIM. We didn't know it was called BIM at the time. We just had these 3D models of our equipment. And we use it on the M25 widening project with Balfour BT and Skanska. And we were actually building it into a 3D uh, model of the whole of the M25. And immediately you saw the huge benefit of that from risk management, from hazard identification, and from communicating with the site teams about the, you know, the, the equipment we were using um, on, on that winding project and where it went and whether there were any clashes and things like that. So it started early doors, but probably the easiest way for me to explain what MGF do, and I, I always think you know, people quite often get surprised at how, uh, how much you know, digitally, you know, uh, how much we embrace digital within the company, but we'll just start from the beginning. So we're a manufacturer. so. We will start with the uh, research and development uh, working group team who will put together a proposal for a new product. So, and right from the beginning, it will be modeled in 3D so that we can produce manufacturing drawings. But importantly, at this stage during the R&D process, we can use our 3D printers and actually produce plastic models of the components that we're proposing, put them together. And that means that then we can then have a discussion with our customers, uh, using a physical 3D model to show what we, we mean with our manufacturing team, with our production engineering team to just understand how they would manufacture those components. Um, and we can look at the health and safety team, look at how you would install it, maintain it, how you would um, load it onto uh, wagons, unload it, how you would assemble it on site and use it, um, how you would... Um, um, manage its work on site and how would um, how I'd actually return it at the end. So what it means is um, our development times have been sort of quartered because we don't need to make expensive prototypes, test them, see if they work. We can use finite element analysis. We can have discussions and iron out all the maintenance and operation issues with it. We can make sure the safe systems of work are provided. And we can put all that together before we actually manufacture a prototype. And obviously, we'll use the 3D uh, drawings to send to the production team who can use it for uh, laser cutting, for CNC machining, everything else like that, and actually help us manufacture the product. Then obviously, we're doing the one prototype. Uh, we tend to be 95% certain of what the final product will look like at this stage. We do independent testing and then we just very, you know, normally just tweak the designs uh, to make them uh, um, 
ideal for use within the fleet. So basically we've used 3D all the way through. So at this point, uh, we have this information that allows our team of animators then to uh, produce safe systems of work in collaboration with the health and safety team and with customers to come up with how you use this equipment effectively and efficiently on site. Uh, we can put together the technical files and the brochures all using the same 3D model information. And then we can pass all this information onto the project design team. So if you imagine with an MGF, we have about over 40 uh, engineering staff. Um, so civil structural engineers, technicians, um, animators, mechanical engineers, manufacturing uh, specialists. Um, we, we can actually um, share all this information with them uh, and let the project uh, design teams uh, configure them for our customers on a project specific design using all the 3D information. All, all our designs are now produced uh, in 3D. We can use the analysis packages if we're doing a frame analysis in 3D and each of these programs can talk to each other. So you're just producing the 3D information once and then sharing it with all your software within the company. So we now have a design uh, by using the 3D software, we can do auto takeoff schedules, auto pricing schedules. We can then pass this on to the operations team. You can get the pick lists. You can do the delivery notes off this information. And then we can all get it transported to site. And then through the, the MGF portal system, we can let our customer know what equipment they've got uh, and all the documentation associated with it, its last inspection, what maintenance requirements uh, you have. And uh, this whole package uh, is managed, if you like, through uh, our own design management system. So we're a sort of bit of an odd one, MGF. We have our own uh, logistics. Uh, we have 64 um, uh, wagons in the fleet. We run everything ourselves. All the wagons have tracker. We know where the products are, when they'll arrive on site. And all our products are uniquely ID'd, or well, certainly the vast majority, any, any major component is. Uh, and we can actually find out everything we need to know about any individual product at any time using these systems. And everybody shares the same information all the time, so we can track everything. So that is of huge benefit, both to us internally in managing the business, but also to our customers. And say, we are unique. We've got um, three animators. We have four developers, app writers within the business. And I don't think we do enough digital, but you know, I'll <laughs> I think our accountants will probably tell me differently. Um, but you know, we actually do all these things and we've done them naturally just to improve business efficiencies. But what that does really is that helps our customers massively and that enables us to embrace the digital BIM environment very easily and provide our customers with any information they read. Well, so um, what challenges do you see with different BIM procedures and BIM platforms across the industry? Yeah, but, well, the, 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 the common complaint is that, yeah, with all these different softwares and, uh, you know, how do they talk to each other and which software do you pick? So what's very important in everything that we do through the TWF and the uh, Shoring Technology Interest Group, uh, the CPA and people like that, is trying to make sure that it's software agnostic. So, you know, these days, um, all, all the software talks to each other. So we, we want to be able to make sure that whatever software anybody's using, that they can input to the BIM, to the digital processes, and that we iron out any issues between it. So our typical experience on a project is, um, if it's a, it's a BIM run project, we have an initial meeting, explore what capabilities every, all the um, partners in that team have, and how we should share information and collaborate in a sensible way. And it depends on what software everybody's got. But what you find is nine times out, well, no, every time we've never had an issue, you resolve the issues uh, between the different softwares fairly quickly. And, and more and more these days, it's being built into the software so they can all communicate to each other. So there's no major issue there. And, and the whole idea is that just choose whichever software suits you the best. And we'll be able to talk uh, once we come to the project. And for, for complex projects, do you think that enough time is allocated in the tender process for the development of temporary work solutions? Um, the customer is saying that they often find they're given one to two weeks, which can be a real challenge for developing non-standard solutions alongside existing order books. So do you think BIM helps respond quicker with the tender bids? 
Oh, oh definitely, yeah. Um, so uh, it's and, and and say that's that's the perennial problem. So if we look at you know we produce say four or five thousand project designs a year, and like typically they have to be turned around in two to three days. You know that's as long as we get, and you can literally have a design going in one day. One to two days later, it's produced, and the next day it's actually being delivered to site. It's just in time, which, which is great. You know that satisfies the uh, construction 2025 20, strategy just in time and uh, using modular solutions. But it's too much pressure, and uh, I think the question's alluding to the fact that it should have been considered early on in the project and a time frame allowed. Um, one of the key things is making sure that during the tender documents that there's enough site investigation information to support the temporary works design, that that's been adequately provided. And it's also allowing time for that design and time for its implementation. And, you know, uh, more often than not, you're up against it right from the beginning. Uh, you're first on site, you're having to put the temporary works in place, There's not enough information and not enough time to do it. So, which can obviously lead to mistakes if you're not careful. So the idea of putting this back and actually getting it developed during the concept stage so that if you like um, um, we, we can develop um, um, different um, processes within the BIM environment to ensure that temporary works is, is caught early doors and tracked through the life cycle of the project which would allow time within the tender period and enough information for the temporary works to be considered. And, and where do you see, you know, how do you see the industry evolving in the next 10 years? Yeah, uh, well, I think BIM will become the normal or, and digital collaboration will be the normal. It's not a case of if, it's just when. And, you know, the b benefits are so demonstrable, it, it, it's untrue. So I don't think that's going to uh, be unusual. But what I think will change is, uh, and, and you're starting to see it now in some of the projects like uh, Hinkley and the like, is that... Um, on a construction site, there's so much temporary works going on. It has to be managed by the temporary works coordinators normally. And it's, it's, it's a lot of information, a lot of different systems, a lot of different equipment. So what I see is that uh, if you go onto a site in the future, all the temporary works equipment will be tagged or barcoded or QR coded. So as an example, um, we used a technique called dot peening on, uh, on the structural support systems, which... Uh, it has a sort of needle gun and it puts a QR code onto the product. So you can go up with your smartphone or your tablet, and find out everything you need to know about that individual product, you know, when it was made, uh, when it was last tested and, you know, um, and then look at associated with that, the design that's associated with it, the, the latest revision. You could look at the installation guides, the maintenance guides. So the idea that everything on the site is tagged. And what that means is that the temporary works co coordinator can start using artificial intelligence or the internet of things you know which can actually log and map all the equipment on site when it needs maintaining what needs a permit to enter permit to strike stuff like that all the permitry all the qa will be managed but what because it's so complicated and because the time constraints and the sequences you'll be using the technology the bim technology artificial intelligence to manage that and tell you when some equipment needs check in or tell you when um, some equipment is missing from a system and alert you to hazards and risks within the construction environment. So for me, I, I think that's how it's going to go. I think everybody will be using, you'll be tagging everything uh, and everything on site will be far better controlled and anybody can turn up to the site and find out whatever information they want about the temporary works on that site. And so what, what we're hoping is that uh, through um, a number of sort of groups that we're working with is that um, we build this kind of thing into the product standards. So everybody produces tags and IDs, the equipment, so that you can find out what uh, on site, what, what it actually is and what how it needs maintaining. But also that uh, we're building in these processes into the, the concept stage, as I mentioned early on, through the client's project information requirements. So they have a list of temporary works and health and safety issues that they need to consider with the permanent works designer, get everything into the system. And that these are then tracked all the way through the project to the actual construction phase when you have the exchange information requirements between the detailed design teams so that everybody knows the information. It's been followed through right from the beginning. They can share it. It's in the format that they're expecting. Everybody's getting the information they require. And hopefully that will cut out any delays and then any major sort of safety issues with the temporary works designs. Cool. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Um, so how, you know, 
are you seeing the 3D modeling and BIM reducing the number of redesigns that, that we're getting in, in, in the department? Um, I'd, I'd say yes, but um, it's it, we've still got a long way to go, yeah, because quite often you, you produce the information, but it's only as good as the, uh, the, uh, the design request that was sent in. So you still get revisions. So it does depend on, you know, so the 3D bit helps things. What it means is that the site team looking at the 3D can spot obvious construction problems early doors. So more importantly, it's saving the customer time on site, I think. Uh, but where, where we've got to get to is where, you know, the design briefs and the consideration of the temporary works has started early doors and we're getting better design information, better site investigations and uh, a better understanding of the risks associated with the temporary works we're putting in so that uh, it gives us a bit more time and we iron out the risks. So I think it's still a long way to go, but yeah, definitely it massively helps customers on site to, to visualize it. And it's that idea of um, you know, the construction rehearsal where you're basically showing the construction sequence, how you're building it. And it's also uh, well, you know, the, the one source of truth. So basically everybody can see a 3D image of what you're building how you're going to construct it. Everybody understands it. The site teams understand it. Health and safety teams understand it. And you can manage the works far more easily. And it's, it's such a visual format that nobody can misunderstand it. You can all see it. And do you think that the client and the, the principal designer and principal contractor could share their digital twin with the supply chain? And, and do you think this is happening in, in your experience? Um, it does happen, yeah, uh, but I think it's got a long way to go. It's, it's only very sporadic. So, so, so I would imagine that in the future that, um, you know, there'll be a cloud-based project website where you can get all the information you need and exchange information. And we're starting to see that more and more, but we've still got a long, long way to go. And um, so, you know, you tend to get it on the major projects, um, but on the smaller ones, it, it, uh, it's very hit and miss. But I think everybody's going to gradually migrate to that, that way of thinking and working because it, it'll prove to be a far more efficient way of uh, you know, providing the, uh, the infrastructure that we need. And how do you think the best way of, of engaging the supply chain early in the process will help value engineer the delivery of the temporary works? Yeah, that, that's it's a key one. And you know, for me, it needs some involvement during the concept stage and then how you actually you know, pay for that and do that is another thing. So you know, um, on, on straightforward schemes, you might just have the, a construction manager in that process advising on the temporary works. But if it's a more complicated scheme, you might want a temporary works design consultant to come in and advise on how best to design it and how to take money out of the project. Or, you know, you could obviously come to somebody like us, temporary works uh, specialist. So, you know, the example would be, you know, uh, we will uh, do about 150, 100, 100, 120, 150 basement designs a year. So if you were going to produce a major basement, it might not be a bad idea to talk to our design team early doors. We've done hundreds of them and we're well used to all the issues to get <clears throat> the best advice. You know, but obviously, if you've got a construction manager who's built loads of basements, then you don't need that. They will understand what they need to do. But at that point, you know, uh, if the permanent works designers don't have that experience and skill, that's when they should be bringing somebody in. But it's actually allowing the time and, if you like, the money to do that. So to bring a consultant and consider the temporary works early doors. And this is a sort of a part of what we're trying to do through the STIG and through the temporary works forum, is which you know, educating clients, uh, planners, estimators. And, and permanent works design is as to the need to consider temporary works. We, we've had a, a comment in the chat, Steve, that says, you know, definitely agree that a fully comprehensive temporary works design brief is key. And I think, you know, I'm sure, you know, you, you, you would agree with that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So it's only as good as the, the, the brief you get. And time and again, we're having to use Google Earth to find out more about the site that we're building on. And we're trying to be creative in finding, you know, borehole information from the BGS and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, we shouldn't be needing to do that, but you sort of making up for shortcomings in the design briefs all the time. So yeah, uh, still a long way to go with that. So what do you think is, is limiting the widespread adoption of, of BIM and digital collaboration? Yeah, well, for, for me, it's, uh, Basically, you know, the uh, age old problem that the construction industry is traditionally very slow to change. So example would be using 3D and offsite manufacture. You know, you just look at the aerospace, 
the automotive industries, they've been embracing, you know, robotic construction, 3D systems, been doing it for a long, long time. And, you know, we're only just coming to the party now. So we're probably 20 years behind at least. So we're very slow to change. Uh, it's because, you know, we've always worked this way. Why change it kind of attitude. And it's the same with adopting, going to 3D CAD from 2D, you know, You've used 2D all your life. You know, you're going to have to learn some new software and how to use it. But it's just that reluctance. And I think the way things are going, we've got to all adapt to it. And so you may as well take the plunge now and get involved. Uh, but I think that's the main. It's just a reluctance to change within the industry. You know, people knowing tried and trusted methods that they know have worked in the past and going from there. So the, the leading software that's available, do you think that it's developed enough to help those in the temporary works industry that wish to engage in 3D modeling? Or do you think that there's more software development needed with that? There's, there's definitely more development needed. And, and that's we're actually working on that with some of the groups that I mentioned earlier, you know, to, to come up with how uh, the temporary works is built into those systems, you know, just in terms of the, you know, the vast variety of temporary works, you know, the classification systems and the information that's provided. So, but obviously all the software writers are very keen to, you know, uh, build that into their systems. It's just a case of actually, uh, hopefully that, you know, through the Temporary Works Forum, providing those systems and advice to make sure that it's um, adopted in a sensible and pragmatic fashion. But yeah, they're, they're, yeah they're, uh, a lot of the software writers are heavily involved in these processes and it is uh, being taken on board and uh, is developing really well at the moment. So at tender stage, how, how are we protecting the BIM technical solution so that the 3D model is not passed on to competitors? So the customer is saying that, you know, they agree that collaboration is the way forward once the orders are signed, but they're concerned about losing competitive advantage when the solutions can be passed around so easily. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the whole problem with, you know, the concept of BIM collaboration. <laughs> so if you're doing it from, from early doors, you know, so for, for me, the ideal situation is you're selecting who you're going to, who's going to be involved with the project all the way through. So you make an early decision and you use that information all the way through. So what you should do is either pay for that information if you're going to then share it to uh, competitors or you should stay with that supplier. So I think the way things will go with BIM is because people will get used to working with, if you like, BIM-minded companies and people who work well. You know, there'll be like an insistence that you're working with somebody you know can deliver and it can work in a digital environment seamlessly with you. So I think going forward, you know, uh, the procurement sort of um, um, choices need to be adapted to ensure that you get that involvement early, early doors and you stick with it all the way through and don't do the usual where, you know, and it happens to everybody, you're massively involved in the design development and then right at the end, all your information is passed to somebody else who quotes a cheaper price, you know, which is it, it's crazy, really. You know, it's not rewarding this early involvement and collaboration. So very much the procurement models need to change uh, to, to fully embrace BIM. Um, and I know there's a lot of work going on with that at the moment. So, so do you think that the procurement process reduces the opportunity for the value engineering? It can do, yeah. So if, if you're just um, basically going out asking for a load of uh, tenders to come in and looking for ideas and value engineering, that should have all been done early doors for me, um, and you know should have been fully considered. Um, you know, so you know the scope for value engineering, you know, would probably be limited. So uh, yeah, it's um, yeah, it definitely needs to change. Yeah. And, and what sort of digital techniques are MGF utilising that help contribute to the sustainability in the delivery of the temporary works? So if you look in terms of sustainability, yeah, we, we, we're always very conscious that, um, you know, the in terms of the environmental impact, it, it's, it's, with the products, it's down to weight. So, you know, we've invested heavily in using um, high-grade steels like uh, grade 700 uh, steel on our um, Unishore products and using uh, composites, so uh, um, using glass reinforced plastic panels and whaler systems on our shoring products. Um, so we're very conscious of that and everything we're doing is trying to make things, if you like, um, lighter, which will minimize the uh, transport costs and the environmental impact. 
and also will help with things like manual handling and lifting operations. So, you know, the ideal thing is to keep reducing weights as long as obviously the products are safe and robust enough to do that, which will help with um, handling on site, assembly, and will uh, reduce the carbon footprint in terms of the transport costs. So trying to basically use the materials as efficiently as we can, uh, with the least waste, wastage using modular systems, um, components that can be reutilized, uh, reimagined you know, several or hundreds of times. So that's how, how we address it. And, and with the numerous different you know, software platforms available that you know, going back to the 3D models, do you think that the, the current technology adequately supports the cross-platform sharing of models whilst maintaining the design data? I, I think by and large it does, but um, yeah, th there are ob obvious differences between the software packages and it's only by actually, you know, getting into the detail and eyeing those problems out that you solve it. But it's just, you know, for me, it's, yeah, I don't think there's a major issue at all. My, minor glitches. It's, if you've got the right attitude, you can solve all the problems. Um, so it shouldn't be a, a barrier to, to adopting the digital processes. So how, how do we overcome deviations from designs not being recorded and fed back to the BIM model? So do you see the use of BIM being bound by legislation in the future or to ensure all parties use it and contribute to its effectiveness? Okay, well, well BIM at its heart embraces, that's the, you know, they, call, they call them trigger events. So if something changes within the BIM language, it's called a trigger event and that's fed into the system and it has to be reviewed and the information shared. So that is very much at the core of the BIM procedure. You know, it's plan, do, review type mentality. And that's what I would have to remember about BIM. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's better, the better acronym, acronym for it is better information management. And key to it is if anything changes that the whole team uh, know about the change. So what it would do is, so there's a change, a trigger event, that information is shared and then it's reviewed by all the design disciplines. So you'd have like an interdisciplinary review of that change to make sure that that change was not impacting on any other discipline or on safety issues or on constructability. And that is so much at the heart of BIM, you know, which is the encouraging thing. You're following processes and procedures that cope with changes or trigger events, as they call it in the BIM language. So it will make a massive improvement because it gets everybody thinking in that logical way. Yeah, there's a change. We need to share that information with the project team. Who needs that information? Who could it impact on? And you just follow a process, it's reviewed, it's agreed, and then it's posted and pub, uh, shared between them as then being the, the new design and you can build it. And uh, it's a key element of BIM. And in re regards to the design brief, someone's asked whether you think there's a skill gap sort of between the suppliers and the temporary works coordinators or whether it's just, you know, communication issue. Yeah, it, it's, it's a massive problem. Yeah, um, um, communication and, you know, a constant complaint is that, you know, the site teams haven't had enough training or experience of different products. And there's so many different temporary works products out there. Um, so it's a constant complaint, but that's exactly where BIM comes in and 3D things. And, you know, our animators are constantly producing animations to show how equipment is assembled and used and uh, looking at how to get around specific issues. So the best thing I can say is BIM solves that problem because it gives uh, 3D, 4D views of what you're trying to build in terms of the temporary works environment, which is the best way that anybody can learn so, you know, the site teams, if they're not familiar with the equipment, at least they can see what, how big it is, how it's assembled, how it's disassembled, and they can start planning how to use it. So they're getting that, so the benefit of that learning very quickly. Um, so, you know, BIM can solve a lot of those problems and it will make sure that people, you know, if they look at these things before they turn up on site, we've had loads of jobs where we've designed a scheme with some major heavy items and when they turn up on site, Nobody knows what to do with them because they've never handled anything that big. You know, this would take around that, take out that problem because it shows you the equipment before you get it. You can see all the weights, all the information. You go, I need a lifting plan for that. It's too heavy. I don't have enough lifting capability on the site and we can't handle it. So we actually have to redesign the scheme you know, and come up with something a lot lighter. And it takes all that out if that information is shared. But key 
is that you know the site teams, the temporary works coordinators, look at the design information, can visualise what's going on, and put that in context on their construction site, and then help manage the hazards and the risks associated. So, how would you go about ensuring that temporary works engineering input can be assured at every stage of the design development up to the AFC status when it looks that the industry is moving away from those drawings? Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, so in, in, in terms of making sure it's happening, what we're trying to do is make sure that within the, um, if you like, the um, specification for the BIM project, that that is recorded early days. And we, we're talking about things like a temporary works register from concept stage and that it's tracked all the way through so everybody's aware of it. So all we're trying to do is make sure it's built into the processes, early doors, and that the client to permanent works designers are thinking about it early doors and planning into the process and that it's tracked all the way through the project. And then that way, you know, the um, once the project team are assembled for the actual uh, construction of the project and the, you know, the final detailed designs and uh, the drawings, that that team has got the right information at the right time and can deal with it and that they're sharing it in a manner where they cannot have the wrong revision of the drawing, where the systems are in place to make sure you've got the correct revision on site and that it ties in with the other elements of temporary works and uh, there's not an issue. And um, we'll take this as the last question. So are there any issues with the ductility and robustness using such high grade steels long term, you know, often outside potentially extreme cold weather situations? Yeah, um, yeah, we've been through all, you know, talked to all the experts on this and there is no, um, you know, sort of major issue with the, the higher grade steels, it's definitely not with the S700. Um, and now in terms of sort of fatigue and cyclic loading, they would have to be in place for a long time, um, you know, to even have an issue with that. Um, so, but, but the beauty of what we have is that because each product is uniquely identified. So if we have, say, like a highway scheme where we're supporting a bridge and it's subject to cyclic loadings, um, we can actually identify that element and look at how long it's been used. But obviously what we have within, the, uh, certainly with MGF, is a predictive maintenance program. So we, we, we're constantly looking at our equipment, seeing if there's any damages uh, and looking at reassessing their capabilities if they've... Um, in subject to cyclic loading, um, but it happens very rarely from what you know the type of projects we do at the moment. Um, but in the future, what we do have because you can track each product is look at how often it's been cyclically loaded and monitor it. So we have a way forward with that. Um, but all the research, everything that we've done, all the testing we've done, that we have, there are no issues, you know, between S seven hundred and S three five five at all. You know, it's. Uh, it's an amazing product. Uh, it's, it's the strength steel we use uh, from SSAB in Sweden. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's an incredible material, uh, very high quality, and that there are no issues um, associated. You know, uh, are any different to say a grade S355. Well, thank you very much, Steve, and thanks to everyone for the questions. Um, there will be a feedback form that pops up in everyone's browsers um, when we finish the webinar. So I'd really appreciate if everyone could fill that in with as much detail as possible, help us to continue to improve our series. Um, we do offer a £50 Amazon free prize draw as a bit of an incentive for this. So um, just like to announce that the winner from the last, the last um, webinar was Ashley Best. So Ashley, I'll be in contact with you and, and get that prize out to you. Um, we are running these on a monthly schedule. Our next is booked in for Wednesday, the 28th of April. Um, and we're quite flexible with the sort of time that we run these. So we'd like to just get a bit of, you know, information from you, what works best for you in terms of timing for webinars. And we'll try and, you know, suit that. Our next webinar is um, on supply chain sustainability in AMP 7. And that'll be um, hosted by myself and feature our regional engineering manager, Rob Eagles, regional sales manager, David Fisher, and technical sales representative, Hannah Hamilton. I've just dropped a link in the chat box so you can sign up for this directly. Um, 
that does say 11 a.m but we will base it on the poll for what time we actually run the webinar at so we hope that you'll join us for this and and any future webinars and um we'll see you in the next one thank you Thanks. Thank you.